Ayachitananda for anyone who does not know who she is. So we are very fortunate again to have Venerable Chitananda with us here. She joined us for the Friday evening Sutta study class. And I think many of you really appreciated um, her very gentle and, and kindly way of explaining and reading the suttas. So it's a real joy to have you here, Aya. I can't see your face at the front of my screen, um, but I'm sure you will appear in due course. Uh, <laughs> are you still there? I'm still here. Can, can you hear? Um, there won't be a hear. delay. It's, it's kind of long, but okay, great. <laughs> Okay, yeah, good. So yes, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. We're very um, pleased and delighted. Um, just a couple of mm -hmm. short announcements before we start um, is that I was thinking to start by asking you, uh, Venerable Chittananda, if uh, a, a little bit about your monastic life and then um, I'm not quite sure how the video recording is going. I think Mel's pinned us both. So I just want to double check with Mel. I, you can unmute and let me know, Mel, um, whether or not other people who ask questions will be videoed or not. So I've spotlighted you both. So you're side by side. And no, um, it won't. Other people can ask questions and they won't come on camera. Oh, that's super. See, I've got such an excellent team of co-hosts. So that means that your your face won't be videoed basically so it gives you some privacy um it also means i can see my face <laughs> and try not to get too distracted by that but uh so yeah and, and aya chitananda just mentioned that there'll be a slight delay between uh what we say and what she hears it takes or maybe the other way around there's a five second delay but um we had a whole retreat yesterday about patience so hopefully <laughs> that will help. Good. And I apologize as well, because apparently the meditation was um, kind of the sound was a bit quiet. So, yeah, I hope it was still of some benefit to everybody. So let's start. So Venerable Chittananda, can I ask you um, to just walk us through a little bit about your journey to ordination? Sure. Um, I guess I'll start at a sort of the beginning of my interest in Buddhism. I was raised Catholic, um, but my mother is Buddhist. So I would occasionally go to a monastery with her on a holiday, kind of randomly. Um, it was more cultural for her than practice oriented at the time. So I had a tiny bit of exposure early on. Um, but I really got more interested after a class on general philosophy class I had in, in university. And so I went um, one summer to a monastery to stay and I just fell in love with monastic life. I felt like that was really where I belonged and I knew that this was for me. So I think I was uh, 20 years old at the time. So I finished university and you know, paid off my student loans as we do in America. Takes forever sometimes, but <laughs> you know, paid off my student loans and my car loans. And then I was free to join a monastery. Um, and in, in the Vinaya, you have to have your parents' permission in order to ordain. So my mother would only let me ordain at this one monastery she knew of in Florida that was a Vietnamese Pure Land Chan kind of mix Mahayana monastery. And it was very much a, a cultural place. Like my Vietnamese is maybe like a three-year-old's Vietnamese. <laughs> so I had a difficult time adjusting to the language and, and the culture. And I, meanwhile, during the year that I was a seminary there, um, discovered that I was definitely much more a Theravadan oriented kind of monastic. So I ended up disrobing from there and moving out to California to stay at a Bayagiri Buddhist monastery, which it's only for men, but um, they were kind enough to let me stay for a while while I was um, looking for a place to live. And then I got a job very close by uh, the monastery. So I could come there several times a day, come for the pujas in the morning and evening and 
maybe even during lunch break at work and, you know, spend a lot of time there um, as, as I was saving up money to go find uh, the Cooney Monastery that I could ordain at. So that took a couple of years. Um, and I first stayed at Karuna Buddhist Vihara. At the time it was in Milbrae, which is like the San Francisco airport was right in its backyard. It was very loud. <laughs> and there was a train that ran along the fence of the monastery and it would run regularly. And there was the light rail system right there too. So very city energy for for Ayasan Tusika, who sort of was raised in the Thai forest tradition and was feeling like a forest monastic herself, but this is where the monastery ended up. So <laughs> I stayed with her for about a month or so to, or longer, longer, a month and a half or two. Um, and I really appreciated her teachings and she's also very Sutta based. So I, I really appreciated that, but I had plans to go to different monasteries around the world to check out if I wanted to ordain there instead. Um, and I ended up going mm, several places and some in California as well, but I ended up back with Ayasan Tusika and I just really resonate with her teachings and we have a very good rapport. So it was nice to be with her. And we we ended up in this two bedroom, very tiny apartment that Venerable Chanda probably remembers from coming to my seminary ordination. <laughs> it was it was pretty funny. We had our next door neighbors. So our, our door was here and their door was here. And so you open it and you kind of see each other. And <laughs> they we we called them the mario circus because the father was named mario the mother was named maria they had their eldest son was mario jr their second son was mariano and their daughter was mariana so <laughs> <laughs> we called them the mario circus <laughs> and then they got a dog later on um so it's like five basically adults in this tiny two-bedroom apartment and they were very sweet and kind and great neighbors, but they were also quite uh, violent with each other, <laughs> unfortunately. So we'd be having sutta study in our tiny apartment and you'd hear like thrashing against the wall and, and screaming. And it was just like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're in the city. <laughs> wow. We're in a small little place in the city. So. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. It made for interesting sensations, loud, loud, very scary sounding movies and things playing. And, and then the, there were the dancers living upstairs from us. And yeah, definitely not like it is now. Right. <laughs> so, but we still, we still, have, yeah. Oh, did you have questions, Venerable? <laughs> well, carry on if you want. I've got lots of questions popping into my mind, but but please carry on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but we were doing well there anyway. We we really enjoyed um, having monastic, you know, relationships with each other and also with other nuns who were sort of in the area. We'd get together and do things with them and teach together or just study together, spend time. So. That was nice, but um, our lay community was wonderful. They were very dedicated in a way. They'd come regularly for programs and we had a lot of good support with food and just offers for rides and help and it was great. So we ended up um, getting a larger house to rent, still renting and with space for hopefully adding one more nun or two more nuns. And we ended up about a year and a half after we moved into the house, somebody offered us um, a large amount of money to buy forest property. And we hardly knew this person. It was kind of a shock to us <laughs> because they had come for a few day longs at our place, but they sat, um, I think week and a half maybe retreat with Bonte Analio. Venerable Analio was giving this Anapanasati kind of course at one of the retreat centers out here. And she said she was meditating one day and she said, oh, all the other nuns around here have forest property, but they don't have any forest property. We have to get them somewhere to go on retreat. So she offered us, yeah, um, I would say like three quarters of the amount of, 
of funds to purchase this property. And it's 14 and a half acres and it's south of San Francisco and the Santa Cruz Mountains. And it's sort of halfway between where we were living before and uh, the town of Santa Cruz um, on the coast. So yeah, it's, it's lovely. It's like 14 and a half acres with a big creek running through it. And it's lovely to sit by the water and it's the water's right by the cabin. So it makes for a very nice, peaceful meditation kind of setting. <laughs> Fantastic. And we're building, um, yeah, yeah, we're planning on building um, enough accommodation for hopefully somewhere around five, five bakunis and maybe five lay people to stay on the property at any given time. We just put our first cootie up a couple of weeks ago, so we're excited. We have to mm -hmm. paint it and put in, finish the inside, and so it's kind of fun, exciting times. And we're off the grid here, so we our our power source right now is just a generator, and we have a little bit of solar power, but down in the sort of valley that we're in, we don't get enough sunlight to be fully um, solar powered, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. we'll see what happens as we develop. Yeah. And our water comes from a spring up the hill and it's very rustic in a lot of ways. This cabin was built in 1947, I think. So it's kind of, you know, it's it's interesting mountain building. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's yeah. been nice. Um, So it sounds, um, Venable, from your um, description of how you came to the Dhamma and, and, you know, this kind of very natural inclination to monastic life, it sounds as though that path was quite, um, you were quite focused and quite um, single-mindedly committed to the life of ordination. But I'm wondering if along the way you've had some doubts or some struggles about what you're doing, because I know for myself as a bhikkhuni, it is not quite as easy or straightforward or clear cut as it can be for many of the monks who have a lot of different options, you know, different places where they can train. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you could share, if you'd be willing, some of your struggles or whether or not you ever had doubts. Sure. Um, I, hmm. Well, in the Mahayana tradition, it's much easier for women to ordain um maybe not not so with the tibetan tradition but definitely the lineage i was in it's it's been well preserved and it's much easier in a way so i think i was a bit spoiled at first and when i came to the theravada and learned that it's not really it wasn't really available particularly at the time i was looking um there were very few bhikkhuni monasteries and I, I did consider, well, what if I just like attach myself to a male monastery that I had a lot of faith in the teacher and I could just be like an eight precept kind of nun or layperson staying and sort of helping with the monastery and just, you know, kind of hanging around, <laughs> absorbing as much as I could in, in lay form. But I think the karma is just really strong <laughs> for me to ordain and stay a bhikkhuni. So yeah it's it's hard and i think again i've been very lucky out here in america the Coonies are pretty well supported yeah. we've i i never have to worry about not having enough food or shelter or medicine or you know any of the major requisites robes or anything so we're we're doing okay it seems that there's always just enough <laughs> of whatever it is we need. So yeah. <laughs> seeing it, it's, it's going. Yeah. And that, that inspires a lot of faith in and of itself that people do support this and are benefiting and, and wanting to help. And it, it's definitely making an impact on their lives. So good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask one more question before giving um, other people an opportunity to ask? Sure. So great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm also wondering what are some of the things that you've learned from both living in community, um, which, you know, sounds like you've lived in quite a few communities. And of course, that can have its challenges, 
especially when you have noisy neighbors or you know sometimes interpersonal <laughs> dynamics don't work out the way you expect um and also the things you've learned in solitude because i think monastic life for many of us is a combination of both isn't it so i was wondering if you could just talk about those two aspects of um, the practice that we experience as bhikkhunis sure yeah um i've been um hmm. the first community i lived in it was just one nun and myself and a monk who was sort of the abbot and teacher of the monastery and he was gone most of the time actually teaching in california so he wasn't around very much and that was very difficult partly because of culture and um, age difference and you know kind of where we were in our individual practices so it really matters uh who you live with <laughs> i guess like living with is and tusica it's always been so nice we, we're um very willing to talk about things in a way that's gentle and kind but that we really understand each other and it's clear when there's a misunderstanding where we're coming from um and we both try to stay open and really understand each other, hear what the other person is saying and take it in and see where we're going wrong um, in ourselves. And it it makes a huge difference when it's that sort of set up. It, so bigger communities I've lived in, it's the same. It, it depends on whether people are willing to look at themselves. And I think that's a huge part of the practice anyway. And having community helps you see where you're, you're um, still stuck, basically, your blind spots on where you're not really following what the Buddha would recommend. <laughs> so it's great to have people there to, to show you when you're being unreasonable or, you know, your thinking is not in line with Dhamma. <laughs> so it's important and, and good to have sisters. And also when you're feeling discouraged it's nice to have encouragement and have someone reflect back your good qualities or things that are are working and help you remember that yeah okay at least there's still this and i can keep going and i can build on that and i'll improve and we'll just keep moving you know so it's nice to it's definitely better than living by yourself i think for for me at this point as much as i love my solitude <laughs> I know I asked Antusico was gone for about two weeks teaching a retreat um, at a retreat center in Washington State so very far and it was it was great to have the alone time too. just the silence and, and the inner calm that comes with the external silence is really great so yeah I think I think both are important as you say and beneficial um, Living, living in, in town as we were, the solitude was, it was sort of, uh, I don't know, impinged upon in a way with all of the neighbors and the noise and, and disturbances externally, but we always found a way. <laughs> there was always a way to find the internal solitude anyway. So it, it doesn't really matter. Um, where you live so much, but being out in the forest definitely does help too. I can see why all over the suttas, the Buddha recommends going off by yourself to the yeah. forest and you know, living simply, staying under a tree or whatever, so you don't have so much to take care of and worry about and good enough is good enough for you to practice. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how much solitude and meditation time do you have now, roughly? Oh, well, we are definitely in startup mode. So <laughs> it's yeah. not as much as we would yeah. like sometimes. Um, COVID has actually helped quite a bit. It's cut down on visitors, of course. So we're mostly, most days out of the week, we're here by ourselves, unless we have overnight guests or the occasional group or, or person coming to bring Donna or volunteer to do work. Um, so yeah. I'd say sort of when when everything's going well, we get the morning and evening puja regular kind of two hours in. Um, and 
we try to work in retreat times throughout the year. I think as you do, Venerable, you kind of yeah. put retreats in scattered around throughout the year for that extra sort of solitude and yeah. time. Yeah, so we're hoping um, when we had a couple of, of lay women staying who were interested in ordaining, we all had much more time <laughs> because we could get the work done and then we would have the afternoons off to just go practice yeah. or have time for ourselves, read things, study, you know, kind yeah. of go sit by the creek by yourself and just meditate with the water. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's that's great. We're looking forward to more monastics joining us. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. That's so interesting. And hopefully for other people as well, because I think you've sort of described a life that's, you know, obviously gives a lot of time for meditation and, and your focus on the practice is like the center of your life. And yet at the same time, we have to contend with ordinary things, right? Busyness, um, sometimes neighbors, sometimes not being able to go where we want to go or having a lot of work and not quite as much meditation time as we might wish and yet the monastic form gives so many opportunities to grow both in community and through having that time to reflect and look at your own mind and then go back into that community with more of an understanding of your mind and its weaknesses or strengths and then trying to cultivate those qualities in a relational setting I think uh, it's really interesting and it's quite an integrated path in that way yeah there is already one question in the box um, and I'm wondering if uh, it, it's not about what you were saying. Um, maybe we should first ask for any questions, um, particularly for Venerable Chittananda, uh, just to reflect back or to clarify or ask a little bit more about anything that you may wish. You can use your little um, raise hand button. That's much easier for us to find you because it shows your name up in a list we don't always see you otherwise um if you can't do that then i can still look for you uh and we will come to the question in the box as well we will do that <laughs> I, I don't know if diana had her hand up and she's struggling to find the the button yeah can you see diana yeah thanks i couldn't find where to raise my virtual hand. <laughs> I have a couple questions. Um, one, I didn't know about needing your parents' permission, and I wonder if that's just for nuns or if it's only up to a certain age to ordain. Yes. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it's, it's for both. It's for everybody. And I don't know of any age limit. It's just kind of everybody. <laughs> all the time i'm sorry as long as one's parents are still alive we need their permission yeah that's yeah that's right i think i think um since this, this is this is kind of a not common in western culture a lot of people sort of don't put too much stock in that rule um, if their parents are very much against it for, for, you know, not agreeing with it or not understanding what their child is doing, even if they're, you know, a 50 year old child, <laughs> they're still their child. So, you know, they just kind of, uh, I don't know, let that one go or not worry about it too much, but it's definitely a thing, um, when you have multi-generational families living together and, and people have cultures where family is everything. So I, I can understand why it was there at the time. And I can understand why people may not be so strict with it now. <laughs> Thank you. And my other question is who brings your food and what's your daily schedule? Mm -hmm. So because of, of COVID, <laughs> we have food offered um, in the morning by telephone. So people bring us groceries or they, they've offered like community supported agriculture boxes that we can go pick up um, from the, the drop off location. 
or they offer grocery gift cards that we could go to the store and get food with. Um, the Buddha was super progressive. Did you know he had gift cards back in the day written into the Vinaya? It's crazy. It's like store credit is a thing back in ancient India. And the Buddha said it was okay. <laughs> it was like, oh, you can leave money at this, at this stall for this particular nun can have, you know, 300 rupees worth of fabric for her robes or whatever, you know, and you, you could go to the store and get the fabric. So we make great use of that allowance with gift cards for the grocery store and also for um, hardware stores <laughs> with all of our construction stuff going on it's, it's very helpful to have that so um yeah back to the food and in, in terms of the rule about having to have food offered to you by hand we hold it as since someone is calling us daily to offer the food at the vihara the the spirit is still there you still have the daily contact with the laity so they're still benefiting from getting the opportunity to speak with you about any questions they might have about the dhamma or life problems or you know whatever they they would like to have contact with you for there's still the opportunity so that's how how we've been doing it out here um unless somebody happens to be staying with us then they can hand us food sort of more traditionally um yep so that's what we've been doing <laughs> thank you there are lots of questions coming for you venerable are you good with that how's your energy oh i'm fine yeah please <laughs> right okay so there's a couple of questions that are asking what it was that drew you to theravada and uh, away from the mahayana mm -hmm. tradition yeah um well at least where i was it felt like there was a lot more sort of ritualistic elements that i didn't i didn't understand and did not receive thorough explanations of so we would do about three hours of chanting in the morning and no meditation and that was not good for me <laughs> i and it was chanting sort of mantras that didn't didn't necessarily mean anything and sometimes it was chanting that what were you know that were actual words um in vietnamese which i didn't quite understand either so there was that aspect all the cultural things and i i felt like the theravada was also a little bit more early buddhist than the form i was practicing there um so i really kind of liked to stick with reading the suttas and and what the buddha actually taught himself as far as we know so i think that was the biggest those were the biggest things for me is like the the ritualistic kind of cultural elements and also the originality of the teachings yeah on a similar uh, theme perhaps someone else is asking about um your mixed background of catholic and buddhist uh -huh. I guess it's a very open question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, uh, my father was very devoutly Catholic, actually. He would go to church almost every day. I think he skipped Saturdays, but he would go to Mass in the morning before work pretty much every day and on Sundays, of course, too. So. He was pretty spiritual in that way, um, but he passed away when I was four, so I didn't get much input from him on it. And the classes we took at church for Sunday school were not very informative. Um, I didn't. I don't feel like I had a very good grounding actually in Catholicism. And when I would ask my mother things, she didn't know because she was the Buddhist side. So um, basically any of her guidance would would come from the the sort of basics eightfold path type things you know like mostly based on sila she had very good sila she still has very good sila <laughs> so those were the same i think most most major religions that are good have have similar moral values so that was always solid <laughs> we were raised with that um we did not really attend services so much at at buddhist places like i said it was kind of more cultural for her and i didn't get much exposure to the teachings 
either until later in, in university. So yeah, uh, I, I think I was always kind of interested in spirituality, but I didn't have a very clear understanding of either side growing up. Yeah, great. Someone also is asking about student loans. They say they'd like to ordain, but they have student loans. Do you have any advice on how to approach this with patients? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was fortunate because I already knew what I wanted to do early on. So I didn't have very many desires or needs like I I lived in an apartment for a while but I never bought any furniture I had like a blow-up bed and <laughs> like an inflatable bed um and I used an inflatable bed for a couch in the living room and you know just kind of living minimalistically and I think the thing that would that helped me the most was probably just being very clear that I wanted to ordain and that sort of helped ground me in um, not being so impatient, like the encouragement to keep going. So continuing to go to monasteries and continuing to spend time with people who were on the same sort of trajectory, who are interested in ordaining, helped me um, kind of stay true to the aspiration and also save money that way. You don't waste money on things like movies or five dollars at starbucks when you can spend a dollar at home or you know just little things like that so spending time with people who also either want to ordain or who are really good solid practitioners who are going to help you um, keep to your aspiration so i think i think that's what kept me going the most yeah right We've got at least three questions that would be really good to get to, at least. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so the next one comes from two people. They have the same question and they're asking, what about a married woman? Can they also be ordained? And what if they have children? Yeah, I think so. Um, if you're married and your husband is OK with you trying, and there are no children involved, that's easier. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it'd be good to, to make a nice, clean, clear um, break with your marriage if you know you want to be a nun. If, if you're just trying it out, then hopefully your spouse will be understanding and, and let you go stay at a monastery for a month or two and see how you do. <laughs> but it's possible, yeah. And of course, you can get divorced too. That's well, plenty of women have done that and become bikunis. So <laughs> it's it wouldn't be unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and children, I think they, there there are rules in the Vinaya about when you have children, um, what to do when you're allowed to ordain. I think in our culture, it definitely be the most responsible thing to do. I think would probably be to wait until your children are able to take care of themselves, you know, sort of grown <laughs> adult children who, you know, you help them continue their education and find, you know, what career they'd like to, and get them established first, um, if possible, or at least, you know, old enough to take care of themselves, kind of, I guess in America, it'd be 18 or whatever, but young children, I would definitely recommend not not leaving. <laughs> They'll need their mom and you can they're great practice, <laughs> I'm sure. So yeah. Okay. There's a couple yeah, of meditations. Like... <laughs> Sorry. You ready for That's the all. next ready for the next one? Okay. So there's a couple of meditation yes. questions and um we might both want to say a few words on it maybe, but I'll let you begin. Because <laughs> they're asking either of us basically <laughs> how much how much we walk versus sitting meditation and how much meta do we do? Oh. You want to start or shall I start? <laughs> um, 
either way, either way. I can start it if you like. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Um, well, it, it varies how much I walk and how much I sit, depending on what's going on. Um, walking definitely helps if I'm tired or sleepy, then it keeps me alert enough <laughs> as opposed to sitting there and falling asleep. Um, I also have a, a problem with my leg right now, so I tend to do shorter periods, if at all, of the walking meditation, just short kind of 15 minute periods. Um, so yeah, sitting, I, I, I definitely find sitting meditation helps my walking meditation. So if I start off sitting and I get up and do some walking, it's better quality. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd say it's like 75% sitting, <laughs> if I had to put a number on it. 25% walking and oh and I've been I need the meta practice lately a lot <laughs> so I've been doing quite a bit <laughs> it helps with the um patient endurance <laughs> yeah mostly just because of all the busyness I I I've been um getting frustrated with some you know, tasks that aren't going well or something. I find metta kind of uplifting and helps me be nicer to myself as well as people around. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if my input is particularly necessary, but um, I guess it's interesting because my percentages are quite different probably. And it also depends on whether I'm on retreat or whether it's my usual day and I find actually when I'm busy I do very little walking meditation if any um, just because I love sitting so if I get some time that I'm free um, the best way to relax and calm my mind seems to be to calm my body first of all and when my body is still and relaxed then my mind can really re-energize much more easily um, so I, I guess that's partly to do with starting off in the Goenka tradition as well, where we would sit for 12 hours a day. And this is as a beginner, you do a 10 day retreat and you'd be sitting for 12 hours. Your body would be killing you, you know, <laughs> you have so much unpleasant sensation. But um, you sort of learn to work with that. And as a consequence, developed pretty strong samadhi and also had to develop insight into the changing nature of the pain <laughs> especially in the first retreats after a while the body gets used to it but we never really learned walking meditation it wasn't a thing so the walking periods were just for exercise really um, and we used to do metta only at the end of the retreat but um, nowadays if I'm on retreat say in Perth I probably do 90% sitting so in a day, maybe I do 10 or 11 hours meditation, I'll do nine or 10 <laughs> sitting. Um, and the walking is more, it's interesting what Chitananda says, because he said that your, your sitting improves your walking. For me, I tend to use my walking to improve my sitting. Of course, it all fades back, but I find the walking really helpful if my mindfulness is getting sluggish. You know, like on a long retreat, you're getting quite calm. And if the, it's like the knower gets very, well, the doer gets very stilled, but sometimes my knower also gets very stilled and then I fall asleep instead of getting the bright mindfulness that can take me into deep samadhi. So at that sort of time, I like to do some walking meditation. I do it really slowly. And it also, when I do it really slowly, it helps me to notice where the thoughts are coming in. So it can actually really help build like silent, present moment awareness so that's quite nice um, but I think I should develop more walking meditation because like you say venerable sometimes our bodies are actually not able to sit a lot or in your case now you're not able to walk a lot <laughs> but certainly when we are getting older you know we have arthritis or whatever sometimes you have to actually learn to meditate in in mainly walking posture I did once do about a four hour walking and that was uh, in Wat Pa Bantar in Thailand, because there everybody was meditating all through the night. And so you'd know you'd be staying up all night. So I'd just start walking at like six in the evening for as long as I could, basically, to like let the night pass, you know. 
<laughs> and I remember one time it was like four hours walking. It was actually quite good. I got quite calm. And as for meta, I just, I do heaps of meta. I love meta meditation. So every day I do some meta. Um, sometimes on retreat, I do like the whole retreat of meta. <laughs> so sometimes say if I do a two week personal retreat, I just do meta. Um, but even if I'm doing mostly anapana, I, I still try to infuse my awareness with loving kindness towards the breath. I, I think it's so important. And maybe because like they say, there's three types of person and it's in the Visuddhimagga. So it's a bit, it's not really precise and it's not necessarily the word of the Buddha, but we all have greed, hatred and delusion, right? And each person might have a tendency to one more than the other. So for the greed type people, it's it's good to do more, is it body contemplation? And also um, as subha, like looking at the ugly sort of features to undermine craving. And for the aversive type, it's better to do a lot of metta and then the delusion type, I think they have to do with more analysis and um, contemplation. So I would say that I'm more inclined to like see uh, what's wrong. So meta is really, really good for me. So that's, that's enough for me. So there was one more um, meditation question, which I'd like to come to because it was asked earlier on. Uh, and that is, please, can you speak about how to deal with feelings of grief and rejection? both occurring at the same time for me at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, find it, I find it useful for me just to be really gentle with myself. Um, lots of metta, lots of, of reflection on impermanence I find useful at these times. Um, seeing the impermanence of situations and also the impermanence of my feelings, recognizing that, yep, yeah, this is what's here now. This is what's coming through. Being with the feelings, not sort of pushing them away, but not being overcome by them and sort of um, kind of stuck in them and sort of not, not always coming back to them. I find sometimes there's the urge to continue that feeling, to sort of want to be in the grief when it's not even there. And you could be doing something else and forget that you're grieving and sort of remind yourself, oh, I'm supposed to be suffering right now. I'm supposed to be feeling this rejection and grief so deeply, but you're not. So <laughs> it's, it's good to recognize that, oh, it's not here right now and that's okay. You don't, you don't um, have to be overcome by the feelings. So just paying attention to the times when you're not feeling bad is helpful for me as well. Um, yeah, and, and just being gentle with yourself and sending metta to whatever the, the person or the cause of the grief and rejection is, if you can. If that's too much to ask, then sticking to it for yourself is good. And if you can go there, maybe compassion for them might be easier in some ways. Uh, kind of depends on the situation a little bit, but I think that's what I would say. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> yeah, I'd just Did like to also- add 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 Yeah, I, I would just add the aspect of self-compassion to that as a really important way to um, learn to soften around those feelings without rejecting them, um, to acknowledge they're there and to acknowledge that they're painful, you know, and you can even use language like you could put your hand on your heart and you can say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, darling, this is painful, this hurts. And you can talk to yourself that way and actually say, oh, you know, this is painful and I'm here for myself and I'm here for you. You know, you can speak to yourself as a friend and try to imagine those feelings. Maybe if it helps for you, you can almost like anthropomorphize them and imagine them as like little beings that are all sad and lonely, you know, like little children who've come to their mommy to get some comfort, to get some warmth. And you can you can be that kind parent to your grief and to your rejection and basically open your arms and, and let them come in. Yeah. 
But I would also say at the same time, like, like Venerable Chittananda said, um, to notice when you're getting sunk in them, because there's sometimes that you just need to step back. You know, it's like sometimes we can be too close and our mind gets sucked into the difficult. And sometimes we just need to like broaden our mind, like even, even physically, you can broaden your awareness, look around, look at the sky, look at the trees, you know, just anything to sort of give you that sense of perspective. Because as you were saying, Venerable, those feelings are not always there. And sometimes they're not so strong. Sometimes they might actually be more like a sort of very subtle melancholy or a sadness. Sometimes there can be something even quite tender, even quite poignant and even beautiful in there. So yeah, to avoid labeling them too much. And um, yeah, to just again, be very gentle um, and accepting with yourself, very kind and compassionate to yourself. That's, I think, all I have to say. Anything else you want to say, Venable? Uh, I think that was beautiful. Let's stick with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're very close to the end, but there's a couple of fairly quick questions. They're environmental questions. So I just like to quickly maybe put them together. One person's asking about the forest fires and worried about um, the danger, whether you're safe from those fires. And the other person's asking about if there are any um, foxes or birds that come when you practice metta. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, we had a, a very near fire actually. Um, last, last fire season last year, it was only about five miles or so from our place here. Um, it was a really big I don't remember the size of it but one of the huge ones you hear about and it so happens that the area we're in for some reason has quite a few monasteries there's a, a big Burmese place there's another Theravada place there's a Chinese Mahayana place and there's a Tibetan retreat center and they're all sort of well, I think mm, all but one of them is sort of this side of the highway where the fire didn't cross. So we were all good. <laughs> it was safe for us here. But I think anywhere you can have the danger of, I mean, out here, the elements are definitely much more in our faces because we know exactly where our water is coming from. We have, you know, the power is kind of sketchy. It's, it's sort of like, you have to know how to do it yourself or just deal without <laughs> power. And so the earth and the water and the fire and the air element here are very kind of in our faces. And it reminds us that nothing is really safe. If we were in town, the building could catch on fire just as, you know, karmically, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, it's, it's actually kind of that element of danger or uncertainty in our faces is kind of just more fodder for the mill. It's kind of good practice actually. So we don't really mind. We just keep our, our sort of, um, I forget what they call them, but we call them our go bags. We put any kind of important documents and sort of our essentials that we wanna take with us. And so we just have that ready to go in case there's ever the need to, to, you know, leave very quickly if there's any kind of fire nearby. And we have like, oddly enough, like reverse 911. So the fire department will call us if there's a fire nearby and it's time to evacuate. So that's kind of nice. <laughs> we have a little bit of a warning. We don't have to just like wait to see the smoke and wonder what's happening. So there's there's a level of safety, but there's also a level of uncertainty. Um, and having that apparent is kind of nice. <laughs> and we do have quite a few animals around. I don't know that I've noticed if they come particularly during meta chanting or not, but they're around a lot. And it feels like this forest is um, 
that has pretty deep energy. So I, I, I have a feeling there might be some Davids hanging around too, and maybe they'll <laughs> help with the fires. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so lovely. I think you've given us such a wonderful picture of monastic life in California, not only in the forest, but, you know, as a whole, like the way that the Bikuni Sangha is starting over there. I've experienced some of that myself. Quite a few Bikuni Viharas, which are small and which all have their own sort of culture, their own atmosphere, their own particular sort of, um, yeah, flavor. Um, but enough of them that uh, there's a choice. And also there's that sense of like community. They all can go and see each other and on special days or Buddhist festivals, sometimes you will get together. That's how I met you actually. I was staying at the Aloka Vihara and um, Aya Chittananda was taking her seminary ordination, the novice ordination. So I met you in white and about a couple of hours later, you were wearing brown or red. <laughs> um, so we went over there. You were in Mountain View at the time, so we went over there for that, which was great. So I just want to thank you and also express thanks on behalf of the whole community. There's some very nice messages coming in saying it's really inspiring and insightful and lovely to hear from you. And I think also to have two of us here, you know, in the sense that there's two bikinis because in my community they're, they're used to me but they're not used to having different voices, different, you know, um, representations of what it looks like to be a bikini because they're not all the same. <laughs> we come from very diverse backgrounds and yeah. So lots of lovely messages coming in. And before we end, I just want to invite, uh, I think it's Derek or Mel, I'm not sure, maybe Mel to say a few words to end the session and then we'll come back and I'll thank you. Um, and we can all wave goodbye. Yeah. Thank you, Venerable Sandra. Um, thank you so much for pushing on such a wonderful, enjoyable session. And um, to Venerable Titananda, thank you for your generosity in coming to visit us again so soon. It's um, been really inspiring and just beautiful to hear. And I kind of think I'm going to dream of the, the Redwood Forest tonight. <laughs> so thank you so much. Just a note um, to the community that obviously today's session is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of beautiful generosity. So um, if you're able to offer some dana, um, any contribution is gratefully received as always to help support Venerable Chanda's physical needs and the day-to-day -day running of the current residents with the aim that one day, hopefully not in the too far distant future, we'll be able to celebrate the England's first monastery where women can train towards full bikini ordination and hopefully be able to welcome Venerable Chitananda over here and and uh, have some lovely company for Venerable Chanda. So thank you so very much. I'll just pop the donate link in the chat box again. And once again, Venerable, thank you for your generosity and your time. Oh, thank you, Mel. And just a really warm thanks to both the co-hosts tonight, Derek and Mel, who've done a wonderful job in recording this. So you can listen again and, uh, hopefully this has inspired some of you to, um, you know, just ask a few more questions about monastic life and whether it might even work for you. And who knows, even that journey into the practice, however far you go and whichever direction it leads, is always full of the unexpected, I would say. And the more opportunities we have, the more um, choices become um, apparent to us. You know, it might be something we've never thought of until we actually go and visit a place. Uh, and there can just be, like Venerable said, you know, there can be just this sense of, oh, this is my path, you know, and it's such a precious thing that that path can be honoured by actually being able to provide the training opportunities, the facilities, the places, the support, <laughs> you know, in order to, to fulfil that aspiration. So, yeah, I also very much look forward to being able to develop something similar here and to have the important feedback and advice from my bikini sisters overseas. And if anybody would also like to um, donate to towards Ayachatananda's place, then the link is the Karuna Buddhist Vihara. So I think we gave you that link on Friday, but there might be people here who want to look it up. And of course you can look at their website too. They're both very wonderful teachers, I, um, Santusika and also Venerable Chittananda, who told us on Friday that she's not really a teacher, but 
I don't really think that's true. <laughs> we all think that. This is the thing. We all actually think that. That's part of, unfortunately, that's part of internalised patriarchy, I think, that we um, feel we have to be more than good enough, exceptionally wonderful in order to teach. But we're learning, and this is part of the learning and part of the practice. So um, thank you for being such a lovely group of people warm and kind and generous group of people with whom to share because that certainly for me makes it a lot easier uh, a lot safer and more forthcoming to share the dhamma yeah so thank you everybody and again to venerable chitananda lovely to see you and you've helped me out on this is the beautiful thing it wasn't only the fact that it was nice to see you for a couple of days it was also a weekend where i was feeling particularly drained after a lot of uh, hard work and changes in the team and all kinds of things that happened <laughs> this week. So um, yeah, she sort of came along to give me that beautiful uh, sisterly support. So that's real spiritual companionship. And of course, I'll do the same for you as well, anytime. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to help how I can, so yeah. yeah. Excellent. So we